Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, Stressed Out, the Consequences of Environmentally Induced Stress on Mouse Models, presented by Brianna Gaskell, PhD. We are excited to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots. To learn more about LabRoots, please visit www.labroots.com. I'm Judy O'Rourke of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. This is an educational webinar and thus offers free race continuing education credits. After the webinar is over and to get your CE credits, click on the CE button located in the bottom left hand corner of your web page. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive and we encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want and any time you want during the presentation. Just click on the green Q&A button located in the lower left of the presentation window and type your question into the box that appears on the screen. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. Also, please notice that you're viewing the presentation in the slide window. To enlarge the window, just click on the screen icon located in the lower right. Finally, if you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of the presentation window or use the Q&A button to let us know that you're having a problem. Thank you. Now I'd like to introduce Brianna Gaskell, PhD, Assistant Professor of Animal Welfare in the College of Veterinary Medicine and part of the Center for Animal Welfare Science at Purdue University. Dr. Gaskell received a PhD in Animal Behavior and Wellbeing from Purdue. She worked as a postdoctoral research scientist at Charles River studying the behavior and well-being of laboratory rodents. Dr. Gaskell's research program focuses on welfare assessment of laboratory animals. She uses natural behavior, psychology, and effective state to assess an animal's overall well-being. Dr. Gaskell is especially interested in discovering how better welfare can translate into better and more robust science. Dr. Gaskell has been involved in developing new and improved types of cognitive testing for mice that are used in psychiatric and neuroscience research and has published in behavior and well-being, laboratory animal and experimental psychology literatures. Her complete bio is on the LabRoots site. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Brianna Gaskell. I will now turn the presentation over to her. Thank you, Judy. Um, I want to say thank you to everyone who is listening in on this presentation because it's obviously something I find very important and something that I think we don't necessarily always talk enough about. Um, so I'm hoping that you'll get at least some information, hopefully some ideas to take away from this presentation um, at the end. And I'm really looking forward to any questions that you all have at the end as well. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, but before we really get into too much of the nitty gritty details, um, I want to start off with a, a bit of a story. Um, so I want to introduce you to Hans Selyer, I think I'm pronouncing that right, who is really the, the father of stress physiology. And um, just to kind of give you an idea of how he stumbled across the stress response, um, in the 1930s, he was a young budding scientist and you know trying to look at how hormones affected uh, the body and so he was actually beginning to study a, an extract that came from an ovary and he was starting to give some rats that he was utilizing daily injections of this extract and let's just say that hans probably didn't take uh, the I cook training course on how to properly give injections to rats because as the story goes, he was not very well practiced and sometimes dropped the rats, sometimes they wiggled away, he chased them around the room. Um, and so therefore he had a very difficult time actually giving these daily injections. Uh, you might think that after several months of doing this, he might get better, but uh, later on, uh, when he was assessing what type of changes uh, were having, were occurring in these rats based on his extract, he found that m many of the rats had ulcers, they had enlarged adrenal glands and shrunken uh, immune tissues. And so he was like, oh, this is great. I found out what this extract potentially does to the body. But as a good scientist, he went back and he uh, did the same thing looking at just injecting the rats with saline. Lo and behold, he found out that they had the exact same results. 
um, and physiological changes. And he more or less reasoned out that it was probably um, his poor injection procedures that was potentially causing this, um, this reaction in these animals and that they had a nonspecific response to some kind of unpleasantness. And so as he went on, he, he was like, all right, I want to look into this a little bit further. So what he did is he, again, probably not something that would go through our eye cook today, but he put rats on the roof of the building in the middle of winter. He put rats in the boiler room, forced them into exercise, as well as uh, did surgical procedures on these animals. And he came to find out that they had all of the same physiological response, even though the environment they were in was quite different. And so really at this point, he had discovered the beginning of stress, uh, stress-related disease. And um, so he was trying to figure out how, what to call this and actually borrowed a term from physics and ultimately came up with the word stress and how to describe these physiological non, um, uh, non-specific responses to some type of unpleasantness. So we called it stress. And really he formulated this idea that um, we see the exact same response to a broad array of stressors and that if they happen for too long, uh, people and animals get sick. And so not only that, but he terms and identified that stress uh, can be good and stress can be bad. So stress in general is any alteration to homeostasis um, and that there's a difference between uh, really the outcome and making stress a good stress or bad stress. So distress is an alteration that cannot be corrected without compromising an alternative biological system. So for instance, this might be malnutrition affecting reproduction rates. Uh, but use stress is an alteration that ultimately leads to behavioral and physiological development and an animal's or human's ability to better cope with future challenges. So really it's the way that um, the end goal. So when you think about an example of this is exercise. So we stress our body um, through exercise, but to eventually get better and stronger as you uh, progress in your workouts. So why am I telling you this story besides just giving you some background as to uh, where stress physiology came from? Well, if you think about it, the way that Cellier stumbled upon the um, stress uh, pathway is through the way that he was working with his laboratory animals, and especially in a way that is not necessarily um, good for them and was stressful. So I'd like you to think about, um, you know, where we would be if he hadn't accidentally been untrained uh, in giving his injections and stumbling across this uh, non-specific response to unpleasantness and where we might be today. And think about it in terms of the research that we're doing now and how the things, the ways that we're handling animals, um, the environments we're putting them in may be causing some types of stress. So. Uh, moving into the main part of this talk. So uh, environmental stressors, especially when we're thinking about them in terms for rodents in particular, um, there's lots of things that can lead to stress. So for instance, the lack of retreat space um, is seen as a high predation risk, which I'm attempting to illustrate with this image on the right um, of a, uh, an undergraduate student working in, uh, in my lab. And so the animals don't have an ability to hide. And so they're prey species. And this is a very high drive for them because it means survival. And so if they don't have a retreat space, this is stressful because they aren't able to hide from the predators that they perceive us to be, even if we're not necessarily going to eat them. Um, so there's no ability to aid in thermal regulation quite often because there's no place for them to huddle in. Uh, and especially if we're utilizing in a uh, ventilated caging, there's no ability to shelter from drafts, which is actually something rodents are afraid of because it's that last stimulus right before you're picked up by a bird of prey. So puffs of air are actually very aversive to rodents. Um, physical, when I say physical, I mean physical facilities. So this could be background noise or ultrasounds um, that's being given off by various things like uh, actually your computer screens or ventilation systems or even water faucets. 
um, or even the jingling of your keys actually gives off a lot of ultrasounds. And then just thinking of just general lighting um, and the fact that rodents are nocturnal and find bright open, uh, bright open spaces very aversive. And yet we don't necessarily tailor any of the lighting uh, to these animals' um, needs. But you can also have social stressors. So you have odor and auditory cues from other cages or animals. Um, cage cleaning, one of the absolute things that we have to do in order to keep these animals healthy, uh, actually disrupts urine marking and communication, as well as being a stressful act. And I'll, I'll illustrate this a little bit further. And then lastly, temperature is actually a really big stressor, specifically for mice in particular. Um, and that they're actually cold stress in the laboratory. And we'll get into that in each of these in a little bit more detail as we go along. So if we're not allowed to alleviate these stressors, they lead to chronic uncontrollable stress. And we start seeing those nonspecific uh, responses to unpleasantness or the beginnings of potentially stress-related disease um, that Cellier found. So all of these, this uncontrollable stress can really alter autonomic function, neuroendocrine function, and really immune responses, and can lead to the development of abnormal behaviors, which is a welfare concern, but is also a science concern in the fact that a lot of different animals with these abnormal behaviors have altered uh, brain development um, and possibly poor models, especially depending on what you're utilizing this particular model for. And ultimately, it's an indicator of poor welfare. Um, and this poor little guy here in the image that I'm showing you, his mother has plucked him. It's a black six mouse, and his mother has barbered him almost completely nude. And so um, this is obviously a very extreme example of an abnormal behavior. But um, obviously, this particular animal is not going to be a really great model for some type of metabolic study because they're, they're losing so much heat due to not having fur cover. All right, so let's go through each of these environmental stressors. Now, I, I definitely want to put out that this presentation is not completely inclusive of all of the environmental stressors. These are just some that I felt like were good to, um, to focus on. Um, so there's lots of other environmental stressors, but these were the ones that I thought were perhaps some of the most important to address uh, in the beginning. So let's look at, start looking at retreat space. What does that, how does that potentially um, cause stress? So actually a retreat space can be good or bad depending on what is actually provided. So for instance, nest boxes and shelters are actually preferred by rats, but can lead to increased stress hormone levels in mice. And actually nesting material in mice has been the only thing, or the transfer of nesting material has been the only thing to actually show a reduction in male aggression over just complete basic cage change, no scent transfer, that sort of thing. So it's really the only thing that's been shown to reduce male aggression. And that rats should appear to be more fearful and show less exploratory behaviors um, than those that have hiding spaces. So we see a lot of behavioral response changes when animals don't have a retreat space. And so this is a, a study that was done by Howerton et al. in 2003, and they did a great job of looking at how introducing a um, physical shelter in a mouse cage changes aggression. Now, just any kind of aggression, they looked at escalated aggression. So really, there's two types of aggression. And as you'll find in my talk, there's never a black and white answer with a lot of these things. It's usually gray. So um, actually, there's good aggression, and that's actually called mediated aggression, and that really helps establish dominance hierarchies. And so that's the type of aggression you want to see, because that means that those animals realize who's the boss in the cage, and it's very stable. But escalated aggression is when animals are not necessarily giving the right cues, there's destabilization of the dominance hierarchy, and this leads to the rough and tumble fighting that you might often see in your mouse cages, and usually is the type of aggression that leads to injury. Now, um, Howard and all, what they did is they compared baseline, which is the white bar, uh, levels of escalated aggression, and then compared it afterwards, they had uh, placed this uh, igloo with the wheel um, that's in the picture on the right, 
in the cages and in the middle section where it says fixed wheel basically what they did is they just glued the wheel so it wouldn't move and then the right set of bars is where they're allowing the wheel to move and the mice could run on it and what they found was really regardless of whether the wheel was movable or not if you place this igloo into the cage it significantly increased that rough and tumble injurious escalated aggression and that's obviously something that a lot of people have uh, difficulty with in their rodent colonies is that we already see enough um, aggression because these animals are very territorial and they like to set up territories around physical structures so basically you just put a an aggression time bomb in your animal cages um, specifically in male male mouse cages and so as you have more of this escalated aggression, you subsequently have destabilization of the hierarchy within the cage. So on the x-axis, we have escalated aggression uh, as percent of activity. And so as the escalation increases, as you go to the right side, you see that the dominance hierarchy um, decreases. So it's becoming more and more destabilized. And as you have more and more destabilization, um, you actually it can potentially induce immune suppression as well. So this was a fabulous study done by Barnard et al. in 96. And on the graph on the right, that's looking at just some antibodies to a particular pathogen that these animals were challenged with. And you see that as the number of attacks the animal received increases, you see a reduction in those antibodies um, in those animals. And subsequently, similar to the graph on the right, as the number of attacks increase, so as we go closer to the 60, they had a longer time to clear that parasite um, than animals that received fewer, um, fewer attacks. So this can have a huge impact on the research that you might be utilizing or utilizing these animals for. So thinking about, um, again, the inability to shelter from drafts. So, Ventilated caging is almost ubiquitously used nowadays in animal facilities. And I've always been kind of surprised that people utilize them as much because, um, because mice absolutely hate being in a wind tunnel. And this was actually very well illustrated by Bauman and all in 2002. And basically what they did, um, we, they had two cages that were linked together. So in the image in the top where it has, where it says 4A and 4B, they had these two ventilated cages that were hooked together so the mouse could go back and forth and uh, choose where he wanted to spend his time. Now they went through various uh, studies comparing different ventilation rates. And ultimately what they found was that there was an overall high avoidance of ventilation um, of the ventilated cages when there was no nesting material. Animals purposely avoided it almost completely um, when they had the option. But the thing that was really kind of cool is that in another set of these studies, they, they did the same comparisons of ventilation rates um, in A and B and vice versa, but they provided the mice with nesting material. And what they found is that the mice didn't really care as much about the ventilation rates when they were able to shelter um, in a nest. So not only is it important that you give them a, a, a type of shelter, but it also depends on the kind of shelter. And so that's what the graph that I'm showing you um, on this particular slide. So on the x-axis, one, two, three is actually the days of a preference test. So again, we've got our two cages that are linked together and we're looking to see where the mice spent their time. Now in these two cages, they have the exact same ventilation rate. The only difference is that in the, um, kind of grade in area cage A, they provided them with a nest box. And if you're remembering, I already said that nest boxes really aren't as preferred by mice as rats. And in the white uh, section of the bars is the cage B where they were provided with nesting material, a Kleenex. And you can see that on days one and two, the mice very overwhelmingly spent more time in the nest box in the cages the ventilated cages where a nesting material was but when the nesting material was taken away on day three we see that they show equal uh, time being spent in both of those locations even though technically a shelter is being provided in that grade in section cage a 
the animals didn't see that as enough of a shelter to really affect, uh, they were perceiving the two cages as equal. So really the nest box didn't provide them with the shelter that they really needed. Um, so this is a really great study. If you're interested in looking it up, it's, it's a really nice uh, bit of behavioral work looking at what do the animals actually want. Okay, so moving on to our next little section here, we're gonna look at physical facilities. So background noise and potentially lighting, how those might cause stress. So with noise, um, this is something that I've been doing a little bit more research on. Um, and I've, I've found it really quite surprising that the guide has no recommended range of noise levels um, in the recommendations, which is really kind of surprising to me because uh, ventilation equipment in rodent facilities can get up to 110 decibels. Well, if you're not super familiar with what is 110 decibels, um, let me give you kind of a range of, of noises here. So a whisper is right around 30 decibels. A vacuum cleaner is 70 decibels. A chainsaw is right around 100 decibels. And a rock concert is at about 125 decibels. So ventilation equipment itself can get really, really high and not too much over 125 decibels, you start to have um, issues with hearing damage in humans. Um, and there have been some uh, researchers that have been finding that their, their mouse models for hearing research, uh, they were going deaf much faster than they were expecting. And they found that um, due to some of the noise that's occurring in these, vivariums that this is having, this is damaging the animals that they're doing their science with. Um, even so, extreme noise over 85 decibels, so this is, this is closer to a vacuum cleaner type uh, level of noise, you start to see increases in corticosterone levels, altered diurnal variation in corticosterone, reduced fertility, um, increased infection, increased incidence of tumors, as well as increases in fear behavior. So noise levels itself, something that is not even recommended by the guide, is having a lot of stress on our animals and can really affect them in many ways, not only just tear loss, but just stress. And so when we're thinking about those results that Cellier found, those are having a lot of physiological alterations in those animals if it's a prolonged stressor. Um, you start to see the beginnings of the stress-related disease in those animals. So the other thing I'd like to mention is talking about ultrasound. So we can hear certain ranges of frequencies of sound. And so I've got this image here and it's got in black, the line shows the frequencies on the x-axis that humans can hear with the, the best frequencies that humans can hear being down there in the trough of that U-shape. Um, and you can see transposed on top of it is the same kind of graph of frequencies that mice can hear. And you can see the blued in section is really where the animals do most of their vocal communication. And so it's, it's 10 uh, frequency of about 10 kilohertz and higher. And um, so a lot of the ultrasound that's being given off in our environments, our vivariums, is something that we can't actually hear. And so um, it can be emitted by computers, water taps. Um, actually, I've heard some instances of people putting in um, uh, motion sensors that uh, turn on, not necessarily lighting, but might be in the hallways. Those actually utilize ultrasound. And so it's like having um, an air horn constantly going off in your facility. So hopefully nobody is really looking into utilizing any type of motion detectors um, and especially making sure that maybe if they are, if you do need to use these, they are not utilizing ultrasound um, for this detection. And so also ultimately you've got all this noise going on that we as humans don't perceive at all. Um, but these noises can really disrupt calls from pups because those occur in the ultrasound as well as sexual communication. Um, as a fun little tidbit, a male mice actually sing to females um, at, before copulation. And so um, it actually sounds very close to bird song. And so it's, this can easily be disrupted if you have a lot of other ultrasonic noise occurring in your facilities. 
So to just give you some examples of some daytime noise variability, we've got uh, two rooms here. So room one is uh, labeled as A and room two is labeled as B. And room one is considered a very high traffic um, by Varian. There, it's used by multiple PIs. There's technicians in there frequently throughout the day. And as you can see um, in this image, so I've kind of highlighted 85 decibels up to 100. So remember I said at 85, greater than 85 decibels, we start to see these stressful responses by, by rodents. And you can see in the very high traffic vivarium, there is a lot, a lot of sounds in these upper decibels, especially when a cage change station has been, uh, is being utilized. And so if this happens all day long, um, throughout, as you can see, it's from 8.30 a.m. until 4 through 30 p.m., this is constant spikes of these really high decibel sounds. And just as an added tidbit, if we think about it, mice are nocturnal. So they're supposed to be sleeping during the day when we're in there active. Do you think that you could sleep pretty soundly if you had all of this noise going on in your bedroom? Um, so it has the potential to alter sleep in these animals as well with a lot of these high sound decibel levels going on throughout the day. And then looking at a much more quiet room where there's very little activity, there's only one PI, you can see that there are spikes up above 85, but it's much more infrequent across the day. And then this is just another example of two different days of, of um, ultrasound variability that even in the same rooms, you can have quite a bit of difference in sound, even if it is still high traffic versus low traffic. Um, you can still see that there's a lot of just general sound variability occurring in those uh, locations. So moving on to our next area of stress, um, light. Again, this is something that we don't really think about very often. Um, and really lab lighting conditions are, are really tailored to human needs. Um, it doesn't actually, our artificial lighting, our fluorescent lighting doesn't actually reflect natural light. Um, and having a full spectrum of, of types of light. Um, it can cause disruptions in sleep and circadian cycles in mice. You start to see increases in um, plasma corticosterone levels. Uh, you see increased initiation of fights. And the biggest thing for me is that it lacks ultraviolet light. So rodents can actually see markings at floor, uh, in the UV. So I've got this little color bar thing uh, down on the bottom that shows that, you know, mice see from the, the green blue range up into the ultraviolet where humans can't see that upper range and that mice can't see the red, which is kind of a, a fairly common fact known about animals. But not only that, the so we were talking a little bit about aggression and scent marking. Um, actually, what I've got an image here on the right is actually an image of a dominant mouse that has just been confronted um, in his territory and a mouse that has lost a fight and is subordinate. And you can see the huge difference in scent marking patterns between the dominant animal on the left and the subordinate animal on the right. So the subordinate animal on the right is pooling its urine in the corners as far away as it can, whereas the dominant animal is attempting to um, scent mark around the perimeter and lots of small little scent marks. And so they can actually see in the UV where the scent marks actually fluoresce. And so without providing them with that type of light to see these markings, are we potentially um, taking away one of the cues that they utilize in order to communicate with one another? This is my territory, stay away. Or sorry, buddy, I'm trying to just uh, stay away as much as I can. I'm just gonna go over here. Um, so just thinking about it, it's like taking certain words out of a conversation. Can you still understand the meaning? I, we don't know. We have no idea what, what type of information they are collecting from being able to see in the UV. So, so kind of a new trend uh, happening in laboratory animal science is potentially looking at utilizing different colored caging. So there's been some really great work done by Dauchi et al. And looking at how 
uh, light changes as it's filtered through different colored caging. So in this particular example, Dauchi looked at clear caging and red caging, and he looked at what the spectral transmittance is through those cages. And so in the graph, sorry, it's a little fuzzy, um, you can see the clear cage and the, the type of light wavelengths that are measured inside the cage um, in the black line. And you can see that there's peaks around 425, 475, uh, right around 550, and then around 600. And so 400 to 500 um, are right around that green blue area that you see right here. And it was really the the best vision that mice have is right around, uh, color vision is right around the green blue um, area. And so you can see that when you filter it through a red caging, um, so 600 to 700 is right around some of those red, uh, red lights. It doesn't filter anything um, in those wavelengths, but it really affects the 400 to 550 wavelengths. So the main types of uh, color that mice see. Well, is this a good thing or a bad thing? Uh, we're not really sure, but we do know that it does affect um, it does affect their physiology. So this is a lot of really cool work that Douchy has done, looking at housing animals in clear versus red caging. And so that's depicted: black is the clear caging, and red is the red lines on these graphs on the right. And what he's found is that you see a lot of hormonal changes. He's seen corticosterone, insulin, glucose, lactate, leptin, uh, hormonal changes when these animals are just housed in these different colored environments. And in these graphs, I've, I've just showed you two of them. Um, the top one is plasma corticosterone. And so the interesting thing here is that you see a blunting of that circadian rhythm. You don't see those spikes. But the question that I might propose is what is normal? Um, should animals in a normal state, in an environment where they prefer to be, do you still see those spikes? Uh, we're not entirely sure. All we know is that clear caging, you see spikes of these hormones throughout the day and a much more gradual circadian rhythm, um, a more blunted circadian rhythm uh, when they're in these colored cages. And he also has found changes in, in behavior. And some colleagues of mine have recently done some uh, preference studies looking at rats in particular, looking at um, preference of rats for different colored areas of a cage. So they uh, gave them the option of clear or red or looking at their behavior that way. And they found that overall, rats do prefer red caging over clear. But the question becomes, um, and one of the issues associated with that is that red, um, red caging also, red tinting also reduces the uh, intensity of light as well as the color of light. So we're not really sure if they're choosing it just because it's darker or if they're choosing it because of this unique, um, this unique makeup of light. So then it becomes a question, well, what about in cage colored shelters? Obviously we're utilizing the red tinting because as I showed you a little earlier, mice and rats don't see very well in the red spectrum. And so they see, perceive this as being um, opaque, but yet we can still observe them. And so it's a really great trick of utilizing um, this animal's uh, specifics to our advantage. But the question becomes, is this potentially changing our animal models? And we're not entirely sure. The fact that the animals can go in and out, maybe that doesn't affect them as much because they're in the clear cage with the red shelter. Um, but we just don't know. So talking a little bit more about light intensity, as I mentioned, I mentioned rodents are nocturnal and they find these really bright open spaces really, really aversive. And actually we know this. This is the basis of a lot of um, anxiety tests in that the light dark box um, and that we know that they're going to try and stay in that dark area because they find the light open area aversive. Well, they find it aversive because that's usually when the predator comes out and swoops down and takes you away. Um, and we know that they have overall preferences for these low light environments. And yet we house them in these very bright, uh, clear caging so that we can observe them when we want to. 
And we do know that, um, and this is, I've heard that this is up for debate, that albinos are more likely to develop eye lesions, especially when they're up at the um, upper levels of caging, when they're really close to that intense light. Um, exposure to bright lighting during adolescence makes rats potentially more aggressive. Um, and location in the room, this is a huge variable. Um, mice high on the rack, uh, it's a lot brighter. And we see that they have greater emotionality. And in one particular really interesting study, they saw delayed onset of diabetes mellitus, which is a type one diabetes, which is a, an immune, uh, an autoimmune response of the body attacking um, those cells. And so if the animals are stressed because they're at the top of the cage and they've got Im reduced immune systems, they don't they can't amount that auto um, autoimmune response to start attacking those cells so because there's a delayed response that's actually bad and potentially an indicator of some type of stress of being that high on the rack now this particular study didn't necessarily test that it was light in particular come to find out that flore uh, fluorescent lighting also gives off ultrasound so it could be a combination of those two things but they didn't directly test that but they did find that those animals at the top of the rack did have delayed uh, onset. So just to give you an idea of lighting conditions, um, I went into a facility and measured some uh, light intensity or lux um, in different cages as I've got illustrated here in this image. So I put, um, I measured at the very top uh, through the plastic bubble um, in section A um, a cage at the bottom of that isolator on that top isolator, which is section B, and then measured the, the lighting intensity at C and D in that bottom isolator. And you can see that um, the, and this is in the cage underneath food and a water bottle. So you still see that that does provide a small bit of um, shade for these animals or reduces the light intensity. And the room uh, where that guy is standing, it was actually 328 lux. And I believe the guide recommends, I think it's less than, it's either 325 or 350, I can't remember off the top of my head, um, that it light intensity be below that. And you can see that in all of those cages, it is below uh, the guide recommendations. But really, the, bet, the place you want to be is uh, in cage C, where it's below that top isolator um, and getting a lot of shade. So thinking about it in terms of, you know, what does a, what does a mouse potentially want? What, are, what type of lighting conditions are they exposed to in the wild? So I looked up what, so they're nocturnal, and actually they're technically crepuscular, which means that they have peaks of activity at dawn and dusk. And so looking at the intensity at twilight, so in that section, the bottom section, uh, lux levels are between one and 10 uh, at twilight, and during a night at full moon, it's at 0.1 lux. And so just thinking about the lighting conditions in which we house them, even though these are lower than guide recommendations, they're still really bright compared to where the environment and a uh, mouse might actually be out um, being active in. And so thinking about that and how even though we're doing our best and we still have to go into these rooms and be able to see that we are still potentially introducing some type of stress associated with these high intensity lighting compared to where they would spend their time. Okay, so moving on to social stressors. So here we're looking at uh, odor and auditory cues, as well as cage cleaning. So again, looking at how those disrupt urine markings. So as far as social orders, smell is the most, the very most important mouse sense. It's like human vision. We utilize that more than any other sense, but to a mouse, it's smell. Um, so they use it for predator avoidance. There's actually some really cool studies where they uh, look to see how mice reacted to cat feces that had been fed either mice or a, a much more vegetarian-ish diet, um, and that the mice reacted to those, the smells from both of those feces very differently and showed much more avoidance behavior in the um, mice that had been fed mice, or the cats that had been fed mice. But they also use smell for, for identifying food, for mating, and many, many social behaviors. 
Um, but of course, in order to keep our animals healthy, um, we have to clean their cages. And unfortunately, when we do that, we take away their entire scent world and just replace it with something brand new. And so you often see a lot of increased aggressive interactions after uh, introducing them into this new clean, odor-free um, or mouse odor-free environment. And as I mentioned a little earlier, the only thing that's really been shown to reduce aggression is transferring the nest. So apparently, um, this is some a literature that I've been trying to look into a little bit more, is that in the nest, they scent the nest with their plantar glands, which are supposedly more affiliative uh, uh, pheromones instead of territorial ones that are urinary based. And so when you're transferring those affiliative pheromones, um, you don't see this increase in aggression because if you were to potentially uh, grab a bit of bedding material and sprinkle it around the cage in that new cage, thinking that you're doing a really great job and transferring that odor environment, how do you know you picked up the, the, the urine from the dominant mouse or the subordinate mouse? So you're tr you accidentally grab that subordinate mouse's uh, urine or pheromones and you sprinkle it around the cage and they get into the new cage and the dominant guy's like, hey, I thought we had this figured out. And he's like, it wasn't me, man, it wasn't me. Um, so potentially we're making that worse by transferring dirty bedding, but by transferring the nest, you're potentially transferring the good affiliative pheromones. So cage cleaning, when we disrupt those odors, really affects behavior and physiology. And so obviously there, there's important reasons for why we do that, to keep it clean, to reduce ammonia levels, um, that sort of thing. But it does have an impact on these animals and for a pretty su substantial amount of time. So this was a really cool study done by Gurdon et al. in 2012, where they had um, uh, implanted telemetry devices that were monitoring things like heart rate, uh, systolic blood pressure, activity, body core temperature, and they looked at just utilizing how these animals were affected just by routine procedures. And I'm just showing you um, the cage change data. And so the little dotted line on each of these graphs, so A, B, and C, is when they, the mice were transferred to the clean cage. And you can see that they have sustained um, blood pressure for up to 100, 100 minutes post-transfer. They have sustained heart rate issues up to 100 minutes and activity levels that are much higher than baseline um, in these animals. And on top of this, they found that females had much more sustained changes from their baseline measures than the, did the males. So again, it's not even a clear cut, everybody reacts the same. Um, so thinking about this in terms of when you might be planning to do your procedure, whatever that might be, testing the animal in some way, knowing where it falls in accordance to when those animals might have had their cages changed is really important. Because if you're trying to do something right after, you might see some altered physiological or behavioral responses just due to cleaning their cage. So being aware of those potential stressors is really important. All right, so for our last section, um, we're gonna go into temperature a little bit. And this is an area that I'm very passionate about um, and is a stressor that I think most people don't realize occurs in a normal, typical laboratory. So just to give you a little background, um, the lower critical temperature for mice is right around 30 degrees Celsius. So this is a temperature at which the body doesn't have to utilize much energy to heat or cool itself. The heat loss and heat uh, production are pretty equal. But um, as temperatures get lower, so at our housing recommended housing temperatures of 20 to 26 degrees Celsius, we see a subsequent increase in metabolic rate because these animals are utilizing, are um, losing much more heat and have to create more heat internally in order to maintain homeothermy. And at or just below housing temperatures, we see reductions in growth, organ weight, immune function, and increases in basal metabolic rate. So really, we are 
housing animals in cold conditions. Even though it might feel comfortable for us humans in a lab coat, it's actually quite cold for mice, simply to do to the physics of heat exchange. And it all has to do with the surface area to volume ratio. And that larger animals like humans don't lose heat quite as readily, whereas smaller animals like mice, heat is essentially just sucked out of them. So as far as some scientific implications of having cold stress mice in your lab is that we've seen a lot of really interesting data, especially in the last few years, in how it's affecting immune models. So we see that there's altered fever responses of animals housed in normal laboratory temperatures compared to something that's closer to 30 degrees, which is their lower critical temperature. Um, and we've seen some increases in immune suppression. Um, so this was a fabulous study that was done by Kokolas. Um, in Elizabeth Rapaski's lab. And what they did, the only difference in these two groups is that one group, the blue group, was housed in 22 degrees Celsius, so a typical laboratory temperature. And then the red group was housed in 30 degrees Celsius. So again, that uh, comfortable temperature for rat or for mice. And they found that tumor volumes in these animals at 20 and 25 days post inoculation was significantly different. And even some animals didn't even, um, <clears throat> it, it, they saw vast differences in uh, tumor growth in these two groups of animals. And that's the only difference. Some of the animals were held at a temperature which is comfortable and some of the animals that were not in a typical laboratory temperature. And so there's a lot of implications of how this could be affecting our scientific models. And then when looking at cardiovascular models, we see really significant alterations um, in blood pressure, heart rate, pulse pressure at low temperatures. So in this graph I have below, you can see that on the X axis, it has changing ambient temperatures. So it starts off at 30 and where I've got it stopped, it's, it's down to uh, 30, 18 degrees Celsius. So temperatures going down and you can see that, um, that the, beats the heart rate is going up in both rats and mice. And then as you reduce the temperature, or change the temperature so it's going back to that comfortable temperature again, you see that these measures go back down. So again, depending on how, what, what your study is and what measures you might be taking, this could be really influential, uh, just simply by the temperature that you're holding these animals at. Uh, so increased um, metabolism is obviously a, a repercussion of keeping these animals in cooler temperatures. And actually this leads to from their basal metabolic rate um, to a typical lab temperatures of about 20 Celsius, this leads to a 50 to 60% higher level of metabolism. So that may not really mean anything to you, but when you think about, if you look at the human literature, a mild cold stress for a human is considered a 7 to 12 percent increase in uh, metabolic rate. So this is, these animals are actually really cold stressed and that's having a lot of impact on their physiology and behavior. Um, you can see increases in oxidative stress because they have increased all of that metabolism. You see a lot of those free radicals associated with oxidative stress. And in addition, um, we see obesity models not even uh, occurring depending on the temperature that they're being housed in. So in this, uh, this illustration, the animals in the blue bubbles are at room temperature. So a typical laboratory temperature, 20 to 22. Um, and they're UCP uh, protein knockout mice, which is really involved with brown fat um, heat production. And so in the knockout mice, when they're in normal temperatures, they don't become obese. But if you put them in that 30 degrees Celsius, you start these animals to become obese later um, developing. And so it's just, it's quite crazy that this is something that people don't often think about uh, for their animals. So there's been a, some discussion lately in the thermal metabolic world about, well, what should we do about this? And a lot of people are calling for changing laboratory temperatures to warmer temperatures closer to 30 degrees. But in my opinion, I don't think thermal neutrality is actually the answer. So I've done a lot of preference work looking at what temperatures mice actually want. And we did this study with black six mice. Overall, they prefer 30 degrees Celsius. And it's, this is especially important for when they're inactive. So you can see in these purple bars, 
they spend significantly more time in the 30C than they do in the 20C. But we found that this, their preference changes throughout the day in one, one particular animal. And so there's differences between sexes, time of day, the behavior, as well as the age of the animal. And so um, just to further illustrate this, when we're looking simply at active behavior, um, the animals are just locomoting, running around, sniffing, uh, digging in the bedding, that sort of thing. They show absolutely no preference for a certain temperature um, when they're doing this particular type of behavior. And so thinking about it, you can, we as humans can't identify a perfect temperature for even one animal. And so um, I think it's kind of very humanistic of, of us to think that we can find a perfect temperature. But on top of this, if we were to increase temperatures, we see subsequent increases in aggression just based on temperature. And so if this is already an issue we're encountering in laboratory mice, we don't want to exacerbate it. And so by increasing the temperature, we may have more animal losses simply due to general aggression. Um, and you also see a reduction in reproduction when temperatures are greater than uh, 25C, which is 78 degrees Fahrenheit. And so that's uh, just right at the very upper limits of what's recommended by the guide. And so if you go above that to thermal neutrality, um, you actually will find a reduction overall reproduction if you are breeding in your colony. So in my opinion, changing laboratory temperatures to thermal neutrality is not the answer. So you might be saying, okay, Brianna, so what is the answer then? Well, um, I am going to explain what I'm going to show you here in a second because I can't talk during the video. But what I'm going to be showing you is how insulating nests can be. And so giving the animals the opportunity to create their own microclimate. And so what you're going to see in this video is there's going to be a little cursor that jumps around. And I think it's the dark blue cursor in the middle of the screen. And it will tell you what that temperature is uh, down at the bottom in the pink number. So right now it's saying that it's 30.7 degrees Celsius. And so it's going to jump around. And uh, at the end of the video, um, we'll talk about what it is that it stops at. So if someone could play the video for me. So, so as you saw in the video, the cursor stopped in the middle of the nest once the mouse had been shooed out. The temperature was 32.5 degrees Celsius. Now, one of the things I didn't tell you is that the, the yellow number at the top of the screen, the 21.3, is the ambient temperature that it's measuring. And so that nest is almost, is over 10 degrees Celsius higher than the ambient temperature that the animal's being housed in. So they can really heat up these nests. And it was measured several seconds after the nest had been opened. And so heat was readily dissipating as soon as that nest was opened. And so it's possible that the, the internal temperature inside that nest might have been even a little bit warmer. So nests can be extremely insulating. And so we've done a lot of work looking at what are the benefits of providing the right environmental enrichment and the right nesting material for mice. And what we found is that mice need at least eight grams, eight to 10 grams of nesting material. And what we found is that females may actually need more than 10 grams um, in order to properly insulate. They seem to be more susceptible to the same temperatures than the males do. And that may be a product simply because they're just a little bit smaller than the males. Um, we see reductions in food consumption um, when they are provided with uh, nesting material, uh, reductions in physiological thermogenesis, reductions in pup mortality, as well as more pups produced per cage. And so that's actually the image that I'm showing you over to the right. And we've got provision of EnviroDry or nestlets. And I will say it was equal amounts. So we gave them um, eight grams of EnviroDry and eight grams of nestlets, which is actually three nestlets. And that is very uncommon for people to utilize. And so we found that regardless of the type of enrichment you give them, if you give them enough nesting material, they have significantly more pups than controls that don't have any nesting material. And this really translates in the breeding life of an animal of 10 to 12 and a half more pups on average 
per cage. Now that's averaged over several strains, but ultimately you get more pups um, from the same animals. And so going through some of these other slides here quickly, the benefits of giving the right enrichment and the right type of nesting material. This is a study that I conducted with some colleagues um, at Charles River. We were implement, we were mimicking a tox environment, a tox study, where we uh, were injecting animals with cyclophosphamide, which is a, an immune modulating drug. It's often utilized in ke chemotherapies. And it's a pretty well studied item. Um, in the toxicological field. And so what we did is we injected these animals with cyclophosphamide once a week for 13 weeks. And what we did is uh, we collected uh, fecal pellets to determine overall uh, corticosterone levels. And so this graph is actually showing you the difference from their baseline before the study started. So zero equals baseline. So if it, the bar is above it, it means that their level of hormones was more than when they started. And if it's under, it means that it's reduced below baseline. Um, and so what we found is that um, animals that were given saline, um, so we had saline controls in this study as well, that controls actually had significantly higher levels of corticosterone metabolites um, even uh, when they weren't given nesting material. So basically what that's saying is that that gray bar in the saline side is significantly higher than zero. Um, but when the mice were given nesting material, it really showed no difference. But the really important result that we found is that the animals that were provided with cyclophosphamide had a significant increase in stress um, metabolites found in their feces um, when they did not have any nesting material. And actually the animals, again, that, did, that got cyclophosphamide but had a nest had almost exact levels of um, the baseline before they even started. So these animals, even though they were given this drug that's supposed to make them not necessarily feel very well, their stress levels were so much lower. And in the same study, we, saw, we found that mice with nesting material actually had higher relative percent B lymphocytes um, compared to controls. Now this is average over whether they got cyclophosphamide or not. So this was a really great result showing that these animals are adapting to uh, potential stress. So everyone got injections, but that the animals that were provided with enough nesting material, we gave them uh, 10 grams of nesting material in this study, that they seem to adapt to these stressors much better. So you may be thinking, okay, Brianna, so you know, mice experience a lot of stress in the wild, you know, they, uh, it gets really cold, sometimes food, they can't find food. Um, and actually, one of my favorite anecdotes is that um, mice have been documented to live and breed in meat freezers. So this is negative 40 degrees Celsius. However, in the laboratory, they will uh, become hypothermic within 12 to 26 minutes at about the same temperature. So the question becomes, why is it one can flourish in essentially a temperature and one can't? Well, really, if we think about it, animals exist to behave and they use behavior in order to control the environment. So even though it's a stressor, it really depends on the animal's ability to feel like they can control that stressor and create, let's say, a small microclimate, a nice warm nest inside of a meat freezer, and they can stay warm. Um, so really behavior gives animals the ability to control or even their perception of controlling stressors. And this was very well illustrated by a fabulous researcher um, named Weiss in 1970. And what he found was that rats who were uh, subjected to an electric shock, um, animals that were given an indicator like a little light as to when the shock was going to occur, they uh, did not show the same stress responses as did the animals that received the same intensity and duration of the shock. So the rats on the left that didn't get the indicator, they had ulcers and some of those animals died, whereas these other animals on the right that had the cue that told them when it was coming um, did not have any of those physiological alterations. So in conclusion, and I realize I've gone really long because I'm really excited about telling everyone about this, um, that the lab environment is not very well designed for animals that live within it. And that ultimately stress is inevitable, 
But when you think about your animals, try and figure out how you can give them the tools to control the stressors around them so that they can build different types of enrichments and um, shelter themselves from those stressors. And really the right environmental enrichment can, can help with that. And so don't worry about the stressors if you give the animals the tools to control them. And with that, I will take questions. I know I've gone long, but um, I'm happy to answer any uh, that anybody might have. Thank you, Dr. Gaskill, for that informative presentation. It's time for Q&A. So if you have a question you'd like to ask Dr. Gaskill, please do so now. Just click on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window, type your question into the box that appears on the screen, and click on the Send button. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. So let's get started. Our first question is from Suzette at Novartis Institutes for Biomedical Research, and she asks, is there data of this nature for induced stress activators for dogs and monkeys? I'm guessing you're asking if it's the same environmental stressors. And there is some research, especially in non-human primates, that does show that there are, um, I think specifically uh, the lack of retreat space. Those animals do show increased stress responses. I'm not familiar with much of the dog research, so I don't feel like I can answer that. Um, but I think the research does exist. It's just sometimes very hard to find and it's, it's fairly limited um, overall. But there, are, there is literature in um, non-human primates, I do know that, as far as environmental stressors. Okay, Jeff from UKCS asks about nesting material. Is that eight to 10 grams per mouse or per box or what? Excellent question. I'm really glad somebody asked that. So in this particular study, um, it was eight to 10 grams for three mice. Um, and so as you may have larger cages and more animals, um, you start to see a trade-off. So now you have more bodies in the cage so they can huddle better and conserve more heat, but at the same time, the mass gets bigger and so you might need more material to potentially um, cover that entire group of animals. So I would say, at least within typical caging, um, where you might have up to four to five mice, I would think that right around 10 would probably be okay. But unfortunately, we haven't done the research to look at you know, how does that trade off? As you add more animals, can you, you know, are they as cold or are they able to huddle and conserve more heat through that? Um, so that I, I can't really specifically address because we haven't done that research yet, but the eight to 10 grams was for three mice in a cage. Hank from Metris, Metris asks, getting back to the ultrasound noise, have you used a sound attenuation chamber in your studies? If so, which one? And if not, which one would you consider using in your research? So unfortunately, I haven't done a, a ton of ultrasound research um, and trying to figure out how to reduce the amount of ultrasound within a vivarium. Um, so I can't really give you any recommendations as far as attenuating um, structures, but uh, one of the really best ways to do it is to go buy a cheap and easy uh, bat detector. And you can walk around to different things within the environment, up to the lights, around the computer monitors, around the computer, um, and identify where that ultrasound is coming from because the bat detector will take that ultrasound down to levels that we can hear. So you can identify where the ultrasound is coming from to try and reduce it. And the thing that's really cool about ultrasound is thinking about it in terms of line of sight. So if ultrasound is coming this way, if you just put up a physical block like this, it actually won't pass through. Um, because it's so high frequency, those weight, those sounds just doesn't travel very well. And so all you'd have to do is just set up a block. Um, so some people use like a plexiglass, um, almost like a divider, and you don't necessarily have to put it on your computer uh, where the sound is coming out, but just putting it a little bit away. So obviously the fan and whatever can still ventilate within the computer, but it will stop 
uh, the ultrasound transmitting across the room. So just identifying where, the, where it's coming from is probably the first step of eliminating it. We are out of time. I would like to once again thank Dr. Brianna Gaskell for her presentation. Do you have any final comments for us today? Well, I think I've commented a lot since I went over time and I appreciate everybody who stuck in there. Um, but just start thinking about thinking about your species that you're working with and how they may be perceiving the environment around them and how that may be creating some stress and how you can take some steps to attempt to alleviate it or provide them with the tools that they can control it. Thanks again. I would also like to thank our sponsor, LabRoots, for making today's educational webcast possible. This is an educational webinar and thus offers free race continuing education credits. After the webinar is over and to get your CE credits, click on the CE button located in the bottom left hand corner of your web page. Before we go, I want to let everyone know that today's webcast will be available for on demand viewing through August 4th, 2016. You'll receive an email from LabRoots letting you know when this webcast will be available for replay. Please share that announcement with your colleagues who have missed today's live event. That's all for now. Thanks for joining us.